You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. You ready? Want to rock and roll? Sure, let's do it. All right. This is Ken Vellante with the Something Rather Than Nothing episode. And um, gosh, I'm really excited to have Lauren Rhodes return to the show. And I had to double check, Lauren, which episode it was. We're um, up over 100 episodes now. And it was like, uh, episode 49. And I just love the conversation we had. I wanted to welcome you right off the bat, um, Lauren, back onto Something Rather Than Nothing. Well, thank you so much for having me back. I just remember when we had that the last conversation, it got really deep and it was really fun. So I'm yeah. looking forward to this one. Yeah, yeah, and and um, and, and you got a you got a new book, and and, and, and we'll get into that. But uh, for for the listeners, we had a, a great conversation uh, summertime uh, a, a while back, and Warren. Um, is an author I read many, many years ago by finding um, the, her book, which was a collection of her um, uh, magazine, Morbid Curiosity Cures the Blues. And um, uh, just love that. And I always remembered your name and then read some of your science fiction and, and, and we got the chat. So we're back now. And like I said, let's start with the, let's start with the new book, um, uh, This Morbid Life. And um, just released, uh, we're here in late August, 2021. And um, as a way to introduce um, this book and allow you to, to talk about it, I have a question related to, 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 to putting it together and in, in creating it um, as about, about your life and about creating art and about um, uh, uh, cemeteries and uh, just different, unique, fascinating events. For you as an author and as a person going through that and, and putting it together, did you have the experience by the end of being like, whoa, now that I put all this together, what is all this type of thing? Yeah. yeah. I, um, this book didn't come together like a normal book would. Uh, I saw a piece of art last fall that I had to have. And uh, I don't have the final cover yet, but it's it's a piece by Lynn Hansen that's uh, a body with a big excision so that you can see the rib cage inside and the ribs are full of butterflies and wildflowers. And it was so beautiful that I had to have it. And so I had been wanting to do a, kind of a memoir for a while, but I didn't want to do a traditional, you know, I was born and I grew up and, and all of that. I had all these essays that I'd written over the years that were um, pretty much every highlight of my life. I wrote an essay about and uh, I decided to pull them all together into this memoir. And so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in it. There's um, dealing with my dad's heart attack and my brother's death and my daughter's birth, she was um, premature, and we were both really sick for the, about the first month of her life. And uh, yeah, so there was a lot of emotion tied up for me in the pieces. But there's a lot of fun stuff, too. Um, I, I had a friend whose brother taught a gross anatomy class, and he invited me to come and spend a couple of days in the lab going through the cadavers with him. And so one of the central experiences of my life is I got to hold a human heart in my hand. And, you know, I just had a religious experience. It was so cool to see how complicated humans are. Um, so I threw that in the book, too. It's, it, it's, it is morbid. It's definitely on the dark side. But um, I just find all of that kind of beautiful, you know, that, that we're mortal and... Uh, fragile and have to take care of each other i just think that's cool yeah yeah well you know i i think now i just want to speak directly about it i mean i mean you you you're going to be an expert in the reactions of people talking about when you talk about death and how people respond to you and and these type of things that we we truly wish to to avoid and um one of the things i wanted to ask you lauren um was that uh, I personally relay? Um, I had a, a friend, uh, a 
close friend of mine recently uh, die. And when that happened, and it was tragic and it was recent, I, I started to think that I really wanted to spend time with what had happened. And, and the realization I had, and I knew this interview was coming up, the realization I had is that I know for sure that any death that I've come in contact with, no, even a person who was rather close to me, I just moved on. Like, I just, like, I put my head down and like, been like oh, I'm like so confused and, 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 and that sucks. But I would, I'm pretty darn sure with some of these things. I, I, I just put my head down, went ahead, somehow this person wasn't around anymore and, and, and just forged ahead. And I don't think it served me well, like o o over time. And at the same time, being interested in your work, Lauren, and, and being interested in, you know, horror and macabre, ever since I was a little kid, I felt like I, it's not like I'm ignoring like mortality or anything, yeah. but I really feel like I'm super comfortable with it as depicted. Right. And I hadn't really done anything as, as, as a person to kind of, what is it? Like, I'm the type of person, even if I knew the person well, I'll even skip funerals because I'm like, I can't do it. Like, it yeah. was totally about me. It was like, I can't do it. And so I found myself recalibrating my, you know, my relationship and, and thinking about this, which, of course, is timely in talking to you. But um, the, on that point, uh, do you find that, let's say Americans, you know, you write a lot of stories about Americans. Let's say, do, do people either like go right into and deal with death or they run for it or what's going on? Cause culturally we seem really confused and scared or something Yeah, about this. I, I think like, that's oh, true. Yeah. Um, one of the stories that's in the book is about my friend Blair who died of AIDS back in the epidemic. And, uh, he and his husband asked me if I would be with them in the last week of his life and help with his medications and nursing and all of that because he wanted to die at home. And I was 30 at the time. And I'd never undergone anything like that. I mean, my grandmothers had both died in nursing homes and my dad had been sick, but he pulled through, you know, so I had, I'd done death kind of from a remove, which, you know, I think was age appropriate, but Blair's death was the most incredibly intense thing I had ever undergone. You know, we, for a week, there were four or five of us that were up 24 hours a day giving him morphine. And it really, it, it took me a long time to like, come to terms with it because he was young. He was 27 when he died and you know, his whole life was ahead of him. Yeah. And I was just a little bit older than he was. And, you know, still now I look back and I think, geez, 30, I was just a child. What was I doing nursing yeah. somebody to death? But, you know, people had two reactions to it. Some people came over and they brought food and they helped and, you know, however they could, they got Jeff out of the house so he could go to a movie and, you know, be away from that for a little while. And other people just vanished. They didn't return calls. You know, we didn't see them. And and not just at the, the that last week, but in like the following time, they didn't know how to respond, what to say. So they just vanished. And you know, for Jeff, he could kind of see, okay, these people are real friends and these people are not. And, you know, where to spend his energy as he recovered from it. But um, it was interesting to me because my folks are definitely the sort that, you know, anytime anybody was sick, they went to the hospital and they were all about visiting and all of that. But um, when my grandmother was dying, they had a vacation scheduled, so they left. They went on their vacation. And my aunt called me from Michigan and said, come home now if you want to see her. So I did. I got there. My folks were gone. I stayed in their house for a couple of days until they got back from their trip. And and I that's so very American. You know, you, you want to be there while somebody's dying. You don't want to deal with the emotions that it brings up. And uh, all this time later, my dad still kicking he's his first heart attack was at 52 
and he's just turned 81 oh, earlier wow. this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my entire adult life, I've been dealing with my dad's mortality. And I think I deal with it pretty well, but he's convinced he's going to live forever. You know, there's, there's going to be another medical miracle and he's just going to go on and on. And um, to your situation, I think sometimes it's easier just to think about what do you do next? You know, even if, it, if you're intimately involved in it, you know, dealing with the funeral and paying the bills and settling the estate and all, you know, all the steps, as long as you can keep moving, you don't have to think about the loss. And I think worse, we don't think about our own mortality, you know, kind of make some plans and, and figure out what's important to get done. Um, but when my daughter was born, I was hospitalized for the week before she was born and my blood pressure was really super high and I could not get it to come down. So they pretty much told me, you know, don't roll over, you're going to have a stroke. And if you have a stroke, you may cut off her oxygen and she may die. So, you know, basically there was nothing I'd do except lay flat on my back and try not to kill us both. And, and it gave me a lot of time to think about, you know, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to have yeah. accomplished? And so I kind of lit a fire under me to get, get my work done, get, you know, get my books out and not rest because time is short and the clock is ticking. And, you know, I just since then have really felt like I have to get this done. Yeah. Yeah. Th th thank you for that, Lauren. I felt uh, for me, I, I, I felt in, in general, like a lot of immediacy towards life, but I found with the pandemic, I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission in a lot of areas of my life. I'm like, for me, the bell is rung. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, so I really appreciate you know what you're saying there about how like you know it, it crystallizes. Um, I I wanted to mention something you know about about philosophy, and I don't know if we got it in into it that much um, when we first talked. Um, but you know, philosophy is is an odd is an odd enterprise, and it's odd odd enterprise for Americans, right? Because it's it's not practical, it's conceptual, it doesn't seem to produce things. But the big connection, I think, of philosophy and to the topic we're talking about, death, which is really life, life and death, right? Um, right. That uh, philosophy is completely predicated on on death. Um, and the, on a classical view, and I actually subscribe to this. So if you take a look at a philosopher um, like uh, Plato, and he brings Socrates, the voice of Socrates, back to his back to life in his plays. Socrates, of course, was executed by the state for corrupting uh, the youth of of, uh, of Athens, and of course, you know, dying is just a, you know, mortality. His great teacher and all this loss. So. You know, even the most, maybe the most preeminent philosopher in the Western canon um, starts from death. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, philosophy is about death. And, you know, his, um, the Republic is basically him trying to theoretically create a just society that wouldn't, like, execute people like Socrates, like a just society. Um, so, uh, and you think of the existentialists, and I know you you you, you bumped around with the, some of that stuff. Um, death is right there, you know, and then thinking about these um, uh, big questions is is right there. And I want to mention one more thing. Um, your definition of art when we first talked, uh, and it was so, it's it, it was you had said that it's a celebration of the beauty of being human. And it surprised me then, both for its conciseness and truth, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and now as well, um, these um, life and death, you talked about the cadaver and the, the flowers. And the, yes, we're talking about death, but you're talking about life a whole lot more yeah. than most people I know. <laughs> I was so I was so shocked at one point. Somebody called me death obsessed. Somebody I knew well called me death obsessed. And yeah, you know, a lot of my work is about death and and our fear of death. But I am the most life obsessed person you have ever met. I mean, I I don't like to let a sunny day go by. 
I want to go outside. I want to see the sun. I want to hear the birds sing and I want to smell the flowers and, you know, just kind of revel in being here now because the alternative is kind of a drag. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be dead forever. I want to be alive right now. So yeah, I, I, I really think it's all about life. I, I, that's so central. Yeah. And, and that, that's the piece where to kind of open up the space to, to talk about this, even what I said about what I told, I'm 49. So what I told you about death, I said about my reaction to death as I perceive it throughout mm-hmm. my life. I said that for the first time my entire life last week to my, to my, to my girlfriend. That's what I said to her. And then I, as it came out of my mouth, I said, I've only thought about that in my own head for 40, for, you know, for 49 yeah. years. And it, it's interesting to have these realizations, you know, that, 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 that come about. And, um, I just want to say like a lot of your, um, a lot of what you write about in, uh, is, is really helpful to exist in that space and not to feel like so weird about it. Right. Cause I'm a weirdo and like, you know, I mean, you know, I'm an obsessive weirdo and you know, that makes me like a lot of other people, you know, that, that makes, uh, you know, that makes us human. Yeah. Um, well, it's one of those things where we we don't have real rituals for grieving. Uh, there isn't you're not really encouraged to grieve, you know, or you've got your week off after the funeral or whatever. But, you know, then get back to work, you know, and, and we're not really given time to absorb something that's so huge. So well, yeah. I'll give you a, I'll give you a practical, funny example of that. So I bargain contracts uh, for a living and there's bereavement leave that I bargain and mm-hmm. you get five days off, but they're going to be consecutive. And for me as a philosopher, I'm like, this is, this is simply absurd. Like what, right. if, what if I'm fine with the passing of my uncle? And then a month later, I remember all the shit that he did with me. And it was like good, good memories going to the ball game, everything. I collapse. I'm horrifically depressed because I'm bereaved now. It right, right. Later, so. Well, and, and grief is really cyclical. You know, you, you're when my brother died. You know, I, I came back here and I had, like a week where I just walked around San Francisco and, talked to him. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Um, we had a conversation where he called and and would not get off the phone and he wasn't feeling well. And I think in retrospect, that he knew he was dying, but I didn't know. And so yeah. um, he, my, my folks will never call me when somebody's hospitalized. So after we talked, uh, I guess he went to work the next day and was feeling really awful. And so one of his friends brought him home and he collapsed on the sofa and they couldn't get him up. So they called the ambulance and, you know, a whole lot of things happened I talked to him on Sunday, Thursday, my mom called and said, your brother's dead, come home. And I had no indication that, you know, this is where we were headed. I just knew he wasn't feeling well on Sunday. And uh, it was, it took me a while to like process that because I didn't get to say goodbye. And, And I believe in ghosts. I believe in spirits and that he didn't come to me. He never visited my dreams, you know, I didn't see his spirit. So I didn't have that closure. And it was really strange. Um, You know, people would say, Oh, I just heard about your brother. Right after his death, there was a lot of sympathy. But as time went on, and I was still kind of grappling with it. People thought I should be over it. You know, and my folks thought I should be over it. They were over it. Shouldn't I be over it too? Right. And um, it it comes back. You know, I, I something happens, and I think about, oh my God, I got to call Ellen and tell him about this, and but I can't really. And you know, his birthday comes around, or his death day comes around, and he's been gone almost twenty years. You know, and it still blindsides me every now and then that. Geez, my brother was 36 when he died. That seems so young now. So, well, yeah, and you know, life is long. My my uh, my uh, my adopted. I had kind of adopted her. My best friend's meme. Uh, her name's Florence. I adopted her. 
she became my oldest uh, podcast listener. She's 101 and listened to a uh, recent. Oh, episode. bless her. That's she's great. Soon. Um, and, uh, she's always, always wonderful to talk to. Um, Lauren, I got a question um, yeah. that I want to ask you in particular. Um, I was asking it around the time I interviewed you, uh, pandemic was in full swing, pre-vax. Eight billion things have happened since then, of course. But I've kind of gotten away to, away from the question a little bit. But I, I wanted to ask you uh, again. You know, here, you know, here in here in uh, August uh, twenty twenty one, um, and the general, the general, your thoughts about what the role of art is. You know, right now, particularly in a pandemic, we talked about you know what art is, but in the pandemic, what do you, do you see the what you need from art being different right now or the situation being different? Well, we got out. Um, let me back up. I, my kid has a chronic illness. And so we were in really tight lockdown the whole last year. I remember that. And yeah, uh, she didn't get her final vaccination until May, early May. So we didn't go out and over the summer, an exhibit opened at one of the local museums about Pompeii. And uh, she studied Italian and went on the seventh grade trip to Italy. But when she was there, she had a headache and, and couldn't go the day they went to Pompeii. So, you know, it's like this magical place for her that she's never been able to experience. So it was really important to me that we go, you know, leave our little bubble and go out and look at the art from Pompeii. And it was an amazing day. You know, we wow. we have not gone anywhere, seen any art that, you know, we don't actually own in the house. Yeah. Tell us about, and, tell us about it. Yeah. Well, it's it was called Last Supper in Pompeii. And so it was primi primarily about the food that was carbonized there and um, you know, the exquisite dinnerware they had. And there was a, one of the couches that they laid on to eat and just these um, tiny, tiny little tesserae murals with crabs and sea creatures and, you know, food things um, that were, huge but the squares were like a quarter inch they were these little bitty squares and so it was all this amazing art from this place that was killed by a volcano and the only reason we have this art is because the volcano you know buried it 20 feet deep and preserved everything and so you know it's beauty and death and um her regret that she didn't get to go the day the class went to Pompeii. And um, it was such a gorgeous day. It was a beautiful San Francisco. We don't get summer days. We get fog in the summer, but right. um, it was it was like 70 that day and, and the sky was clear. And so we oh, wow. <laughs> went and got a picnic and sat in the park in the grass and, and it was it was the perfect day. And then, you know, now we're locked down again and not going to leave until the, the Delta is under control. That day, is, that day is wonderful, though. That it day is. Period. And it, yeah. it was such a, you know, if you only get to see one thing, if you only get to experience one art exhibit in this whole year, that's would have been my choice. And it was everything I wanted it to be. Wow. So I think the nature, the, the importance of art in the pandemic is to remind us that there is history behind us and the future in front of us. And the moment that we're in is still precious, even with that. You know, even with all the illness and the bad behavior and, you know, out here we have wildfires and... Yeah. You know, yeah. the hurricane just hit land yesterday. And, you know, there's a lot of bad things and you could dwell on them, but that doesn't serve you and it doesn't really serve anybody else. And so I think art is a way of taking us out of 
our lives out of the, the moment that we find ourselves kind of enmeshed in and showing us that there's more. Yeah. You know, there's all of humanity out there if you just look up and see it. Thank you. That's actually a really helpful answer. Thanks for that, for the practicality <laughs> of it. Um, well, it was a long way to get to the answer. No, no, I, 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 I enjoyed the, the journeys with you. That's why, that's why we're talking again. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask you, Lauren, so, all right, so you get the, you get the, the this morbid life. We talked about that. Everybody, that's the, uh, Lauren's new book. Um, so you got that out of your system. So what are you thinking now? I mean, you don't have to divulge what you're up to, but like, he, no, no, yeah. I, I'm, I've got about six. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure which one I'm going to do absolutely next, but, um, there's another book of essays that I'm thinking as a companion to this one. And uh, it's called Jet Lag and Other Blessings. So they're, they're just travel stories, but, um, and they're longer than the pieces in this book. But uh, traveling to Greece with my mom, she had always wanted to go to Greece. And so she, she booked us on a package tour and we went my mother's very religious. And so it was interesting. We were there during Easter. And so um, navigating the way the Greeks celebrate versus the way my mother would celebrate. And I've done a lot of um, study on religion. And so I was kind of the interpreter in the middle between oh, the wow. two. Yeah, yeah. And, um, so there's an essay about that. And uh, I was telling you earlier, my, my husband is a musician. And so uh, the title essay is about going to Japan. The first time we went, I don't know if it was food poisoning or jet lag, but I was really sick the first day. But he had a show scheduled in Tokyo. And and I wasn't going to let him leave me behind. So I went with him into Tokyo for this show and just wandered, you know, this enormous city at night alone while he sound checked and talked to the musicians and stuff like that. And, um, you know, before we went, I'd never been anywhere as far from home as Japan. So I was worried about getting lost. I was worried about the food making me sick. I was worried about, um, you know, the language barrier being a problem. And I discovered in that first night that it didn't matter. You know, I, I could walk around at night by myself and be perfectly safe and not feel threatened and, you know, risk getting lost but people were really helpful. Um, one of Mason's friends saw me and she knew I wasn't feeling well. And, and she just kind of took me under her wing and, and made it her business to take care of me. She was such a good friend. And uh, it, it was magical, you know, to realize how free I was that, that I had had all these fears about traveling and they were all completely unnecessary. So, so it's a bunch of essays about my adventures outside the world, you know? Yeah. Like a, kind of like a freaky Rick Steves type. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I can dig that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, Rick probably doesn't go to as many cemeteries and (laughs) I know he works in a couple, but yeah. And I, and whenever he does, I'm like stopping the video so I can see where are we here? This is cool. But (laughs) Yeah. So it won't be, I don't think there are too many cemetery essays in that book, but there is one about, um, I had a friend who wanted to go up to Tule Lake, which is the, uh, it's the Californian concentration camp. Yeah, I've been there, yeah. There's not much there. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it really is. I used to live in um, Klamath Falls. Oh, did you? Yeah, for for a short spell, yeah. Well, she um, she lured me up there with the promise that there was a graveyard at Tule Lake, which there is not. <laughs> we spent a really long time looking for it. And it was, uh, I don't even know what set me off now, but I had, I had just shaved my head before we went up there. 
And, you know, it was the sort of thing where I felt really unhappy and it was either me or the hair and the hair went first. And, and I felt better after that, but I looked really freaky and people up in Tule Lake were not prepared for me with my shaven head to be marching yeah. around up there. So it was really, we got some really interesting reactions because my friend is this tiny little thing and, you know, she was wearing these cute little sundresses and here am I and my docks and my shaven head and, <laughs> you know, aspersions were cast, but, <laughs> but it was a, you know, it was a really interesting trip because we were there to see what was left of, of the Japanese internment and, you know, prejudice was still alive. It was just focused in a different direction at that point. So, but that said, if we were up there in August to see the Perseid meteors, and so, you know, the sky was just on fire with these meteors, you know, every time you, you blinked, you missed one and, and then there'd be six more and it was just gorgeous. So it was this, you know, weird balance between the lake itself is beautiful and it was all full of waterfowl and, you know, we were caving and the caves were gorgeous and there was a wildfire at the edge of the canyon and so you could see that off in the distance at night. You know, all these beautiful things and then this weird prejudice about were we lesbians and, you know, what difference did it make? Yeah. You know, so... Well, one of the things is it's interesting. I, I always I went uh, just speaking of Tule Lake because it's 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 such a and I I'm fascinated with that area and with its its, it's terrible history. But one of the things I found in my studies there, I learned about it just reading through a book. Uh, I, mm -hmm. Prior to living on the West Coast, I was probably on the East Coast at the time, and it was a book about Dylan S. Meyer. But there was a huge overlap between what that. Uh, person ran. He was the administrator for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, mm -hmm. but he also administered Tule Lake in, mm -hmm. the, in the U.S. concentration camp. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, that affected uh, American citizens, uh, yeah. Japanese descent in, the, in this country. So it was, I was really just, I remember a lot of details around it being spellbound by the kind of pernicious racism, you know, like within that same administrative mind in both yeah. places. So this is, it, I got a weird vibe from the lands there, but I'd never saw the lake. So I, it was pretty. And, uh, you know, we stayed over in, um, in the national park in the, maybe it's a state park. So there's a lot of history of the, the moto. And I knew about that because there's a national cemetery in San Francisco where, the Buffalo soldiers, the, the black soldiers that fought against the Native Americans are buried. And so, you know, it's just layer and layer of history and, and prejudice and um, just a fascinating place. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, so, wow, we got a, we got a lot, uh, we got a lot to vibe on, but one of the, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to do honestly is to just zero right in um, on asking the question again, only because I've been talking about this, why is there something rather than nothing question? And it's such a, for me, it's like an annoying question because I annoy myself with it, but it's also <laughs> funny. And also like, I don't know, maybe in a yogic way allows people to expel air and just like the breathe again. Um, cause it's such a daffy question, but I don't often get to ask the same guest, the, uh, the same, you know, the question twice. I'm just going to ask you the question again. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why? Well, um, I think there is something rather than nothing because of yeah. stories, because stories sing everything into reality and they stitch us together, right? The stories of who we are, the stories that we, tell in our families, um, the stories we tell our friends when we introduce ourselves to them. Um, I think there may not actually be anything except stories. And stories make all of us humans, you know, one one people, despite history and, and all the accidents and mistakes that were made. 
Yeah, I um, again, I really vibe with the uh, with the stories to try to, and I, I appreciate I appreciate being able to talk to you again, Lauren. And um, it's 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 a great conversation, and it's a it's a great pleasure. I I think it's a regular check in at least uh, <laughs> at least. You know, for me, I know my uh, audience um, loves you as well, but I, there's a personal indulgence that I can allow myself <laughs> to to say hello uh, here and there. But um, I just want to thank you again for uh, spending some time. And everybody, check out um, this uh, this morbid life. I'm actually reading it uh, uh, right now, um, and I'm really enjoying it. But um, just wanted to say thank you again uh, for coming on, Lauren. Well, thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, uh, I, I just, I had such a great time the first time and it gives me so much to think about. So thank you for having me. I really have enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for saying that. And actually, I am now going to uh, continue with your book. So have a great evening. Excellent, thank you. Bye, Lauren. This is Something Rather Than Nothing, 